So this is the lecture on Neolithic art. Neolithic art uh, is the period that begins after Paleolithic. Um, one thing I forgot to mention when we were talking about Paleolithic art, uh, but it applies to Neolithic art as well, is what does it mean for something to be prehistoric? Prehistoric is defined by any community that is developed before writing. So we look at recorded writing as history, and so we call anything that is uh, a society before writing happened prehistoric. So this is a list of vocabulary terms that you might need for this section. Um, I don't usually do this, but uh, in the beginning, I think it's easier to have the definitions written down for you in one central location. So I'm starting you a vocabulary list. You need to continue adding on to it as lecture goes on. Um, I also thought that it might be helpful for you to see a chart that represents the time periods and um, what uh, the uh, materials that they're using. So for example, in Paleolithic societies, we call them Stone Age societies. In Neolithic societies, we call them Bronze, Bronze Age societies. As they get closer to the modern era, we switch to Iron Age societies. So you'll hear me refer to the Stone Age, the Bronze Age, and the Iron Age all within these PowerPoints. Um, so just keep that in the back of your head so that when I'm lecturing or when I'm explaining something to you, uh, you have this frame of reference. So when we're looking at the Neolithic era, uh, we're looking at time periods between about 9000 BCE to 2000 BCE. So notice we're getting closer to that modern era. Um, we are looking at Western Europe and the ancient Near East. Um, people settle in villages and the villages are pretty self-sufficient. They are farmers, but they have not let go of hunting and gathering. They're still, uh, they're still maintaining their food supply uh, the best they know how or the best that is available to them. So they've figured out how to domesticate crops. Uh, they just have uh, also a heavy reliance on hunting. And rituals become a lot more complex in this era. So in the Paleolithic era, we saw that rituals were likely things that happened as the community returned uh, year after year through their migration pattern. Whereas in the Neolithic, uh, because people are more sedentary, they don't move around as much, the rituals uh, get a lot more complex. Okay, so in Neolithic art, there's some new um, innovations in terms of their research and development. Farming begins, which means they domesticate crops. Um, art becomes more stationary. Uh, in the Paleolithic times, we saw that art had to be small enough to be portable or carried, or it had to be um, created on a place that the people would return over and over again to. And so... Um, in the Neolithic era, people are staying put and they don't need to take uh, their art with them because they're not migrating. The climate becomes warmer and this is a really important part of why Neolithic art develops, um, why Neolithic art develops at all is because the climate is warmer. Now people uh, don't have to chase the herd. The herd is moving when it gets really cold. So because they don't have to chase the herd anymore for their food, then they're able to stay in one place because the climate's warmer. Art changes to focus on groups in the community instead of in, by the individual, meaning uh, if you look at the water-worn pebble, you look at the work of art um, that we saw the very first painting 
that was on that flat slate rock. Um, we now see artists that create individual works of art um, that they don't have to carry with them all the time. And they are able to incorporate art as a community instead of just by one person. Um, themes in Neolithic art are human activity, uh, building of the community, uh, buildings, architecture uh, for that community, and infrastructure for the architecture, uh, safety, implement, safety measures, things like that. Um, we see art take on the following forms. Uh, we know that they use composite view. Uh, the mud brick and stone construction is the common building technique. Uh, we get a new building technique called post and lintel and uh, monumental sculpture becomes a, an important part of Neolithic art. So we always start with a map um, and here I'm trying to show you where uh, Mesopotamia and Anatolia is in the Middle East. So you're looking at modern day Iraq, you see the Persian Gulf here um, to your right and the activities tend or communities tend to pop up along rivers and waterways. Um, Jericho, I would say, probably popped up in that area because there was a tributary there of what, uh, not a tributary, I'm sorry, there was a natural water source and the um, water source is somewhat isolated. So it didn't feel like they were going to be vulnerable to the sea. This map gives you a broader picture of the general area that we're talking about. Um, you can see uh, better where Jericho falls in the Middle East. So Jericho is a settlement, is the first settlement we will look at. And it's a settlement that was found at the base of the mountains. Um, most of the settlements in the Middle East are in an area that we call the Fertile Crescent. Because people started having more time to specialize in things in general, uh, we get some areas of specialization not only in art, but in farming and in technology. So now this you're going to see that the ancient community or the prehistoric communities have more technology um, like basket weaving. Uh, we saw some weaving in the Paleolithic. Now weaving is a specialized skill that they have. Um, we see more specialization in farming. Um, and because of that, uh, we call this area the Fertile Crescent because there are certain plants that grow naturally in the Fertile Crescent that lend themselves to a certain type of farming. Um, crops like wild wheat and barley were naturally available uh, that sit on the plateau in the Jordan River Valley. Um, Jericho is particularly abundant area in the Middle East, just west of the Jordan River, um, in the Jordan River Valley. And many communities of people populate the city over a span of a thousand years. So a community will come in, they will uh, build and create um, settled life and then something will happen they'll all die out they'll abandon the space and a new group of people will come in um, we know that jericho had mud brick houses that sat on round or oval foundations and their buildings had roofs that were made of branches that were covered in earth um, and that the settlement covered 10 acres. What you're looking at here in this slide is the ruins of Jericho. You're looking at it from an aerial view. The civilization develops a lot of new technologies like mud brick building, um, masonry, 
plastering. Uh, they build large stone walls and dig a trench around the settlement for protection. Uh, they build ceremonial structures. And in around 7,000 BCE, uh, there was a pre-pottery settlement that abandoned the area. New settlers arrive, arrive in the area about 7th millennium and establish a strong farming community. Uh, they create rectangular mud brick houses and stone foundations instead of the earth foundations. Uh, and they paint their walls and decorate their floors. This is a re computer recreation illustration of what the city of Jericho or the settlement of Jericho looked like. Um, the pre-pottery settlement um, was a lot simpler than this. This is the post-pottery settlement and you can see that they've built a wall around the city. A fortified wall around the city we call a citadel. Um, it's basically a city that is contained within the walls. Um, society had new technologies like systemic agriculture. Uh, they were able to domesticate crops and create a system of agriculture. Uh, they aren't solely dependent on the crops for food uh, because there are animals in their area and they do hunt. Weaving is a major part of their lives, and now they're able to uh, utilize metal better. Um, they have smelting processes, and um, so they move from st being Stone Age communities to being Iron Age communities. They now have pottery um, knowledge. Pottery is a really important... Um, knowledge to have. So I want you to stop and think a minute about why pottery would be so important. Okay. If somebody's around you, if you're at home watching this lecture, maybe try going to that other person and asking them what they think why pottery would be important. Um, that part of having that conversing back and forth in class, I really miss. So um, I hope you have someone that you could reach out and talk to about uh, why pottery would be important. See if you can figure it out on your own. Um, I will tell you here in a moment. All right, they had inventory techniques. So we know that they traded um, inventory techniques included counting and being able to take record of what they had on hand. And then um, they were able to create a prehistoric currency where they traded um, coins for, and I don't know that they were metal coins, they might have been clay coins, I'm not sure, but they were able to trade clay coins for um, goods. There were several phases of settlements within Jericho and technology changed from settlement to settlement. Uh, one of the most prolific of the groups of people that inhabited Jericho were a group of people that had military strategic planning. Um, they built a wall around the city, but they also built a, a tr they had a fortification system. So the wall that was around the city was there for protection. Uh, they also dug a trench around the city um, for protection. And they built really large stone towers. Would have provided protection for the um, complex, but we don't know whether or not it was one of several large towers that were part of a complex fortification system or whether or not this tower was solely um, its own structure and just aided them in defense um, from a main lookout. There was a stairwell that was in the center of the tower in which people 
were able to climb up and down the stairs. So the stairwell would have provided some amount of protection should the community be under siege. Um, the tower and the wall is a significant achievement because of the man hours and the monumental job that it would have been to build such a large stone structure. There was really no mortar between the stones, meaning that the architects and the masons would have had to have created um, a complex way of laying the stones so that they didn't fall in on themselves due to their own weight. We know that they were highly skilled um, in architectural planning, and we know that they were highly skilled in masonry because the structure still exists um, and it's solely made out of stone. We know that the later settlements had complex farming systems. Um, they also had complex ritual systems, which means that we know that they believed in the afterlife. With those complex farming systems and complex ritual systems came specialized art skills. There were people who sculpted, there were architects, there were plaster craftsmen, there were painters. Uh, and so because we have enough preserved of their tech or enough of their civilization preserved, we've been able to excavate Jericho and find that they painted the floors of their um, houses quite elaborately. They made mud brick houses that were rectangular in shape with oval um, floor systems. We also know that um, their complex ritual system was linked to ancestor worship. It was about the seventh millennium when the thriving farming community established such complex ritual systems um, and such decorative building techniques. This is a plastered human skull that was found in a large building that was highly decorated in the later settlement. Um, the room that it was found in had human skulls that had been molded over with plaster to create a lifelike look. Um, shells, cowrie shells, were used to put in the eye crevice so that the uh, head looked more human-like. We also found quite a few shrines in which the... Um, People had statues and plastered heads of women and children. Um, really no group of people that were in the lives of the Jericho people were left out. Uh, and the um, plastered heads that you see, we found a total of nine of them. We have also excavated other sites within the Middle East that were Neolithic sites and have found other um, plastered heads as well. We know that they buried the skeleton of the deceased in the floor of their homes, but before they buried the rest of the skeleton, they detached the head from the skeleton and buried the body in the floor of the home and then put the head in the shrine. Um, there was a complex way in which they plastered the head. It was part of their ritual system. And the heads were painted to represent skin and hair. This one I know looks a little bit weird in terms of the painting below the nose. It is because the skull originally had a mustache. Um, the paint on the skull represented a mustache. The plastered skulls that were found in the shrine in Jericho were discovered by Kathleen Kenyon in 1959. Kenyon's father was the director of the museum, the British Museum, for over 20 years. 
and she wrote two books about her excavations at Jericho. Her excavations changed a lot of the original ideas that researchers once thought about the settlement. Uh, because of her research, the field of archaeology gained new insights on proper excavation techniques and scientific fields related to archaeology were strengthened. In the late 1970s, Queen Elizabeth recognized Kenyon's substantial contributions to the scientific world and to archaeology by bestowing an official title of dame to her legacy. When 3D printing became available in about 2016, the British Museum was able to take the plastered skull that had been found by Kenyon in Jericho and put it through a CT scanner, what they call a micro CT scanner. Through that micro CT scanner, they learned enough information about what the human skull probably looked like that they were able to use a 3D printer to recreate what the human being must have looked like uh, when the person was living. That image is in the center of the slide that you're looking at now. The image on the right is a three-dimensional printing of what the muscle structure must have looked like underneath the skin. They were most surprised to find out that his head had been bound as an infant. Um, for whatever reason, that was a common practice um, of young children uh, in Neolithic times in ancient times was to bind the head sometimes to the cradle boards to keep the infant from moving around. Sometimes um, they bound the infant's head because they wanted a, a certain desired shape for the infant's head or for the person's head as they grew up. Um, some cultures felt that head binding was something that they did so that it, um, so that the person subscribed to ideal beauty standards in society. So another Neolithic settlement that we study um, in the Middle East is Ein Ghazal. Um, Ein Ghazal wasn't quite as old as Jericho. It was settled in the early 7000s um, and lasted about 2000 years. The community had specialized skill sets just like Jericho. They had architects, they had plasterers, they had painters um, and sculptors. Uh, they liked their houses in irregular shapes and they painted the walls of their houses red. In addition to having specialties that were centered around artistic techniques, they had specialties in terms of the way they buried their dead. Um, they created sculptures that were made um, of reeds and plaster and twine uh, to be buried with the bodies of their ancestors. Um, the town was architecturally planned, or I'm sorry, um, schematically planned, so they had um, infrastructure within the town, and in the areas that they buried their dead, they would um, also bury with them a statue of this little man. The sculpture of the human figure um, was flat and they found about three dozen of them in grave sites. We think that they were part of their ritual belief system um, and that they were buried with the bodies during a ritual, uh, mostly because they are flat. They. Uh, were meant to lie down inside the grave. We really see a big difference in the representation of the figure here from what we looked at in the Paleolithic times to what we're looking at here in Ein Ghazal. It becomes very apparent when you compare 
the figure from Ein Gazal to the Venus of Willendorf. See if you can stop and name three things that are similar between the two works of art. Now, see if you can name three things that are different. So the idea here is to come up with things that are similar and different that help the viewer understand the overall meaning of the work of art. I know that seems very complex, especially right now because you've never done this before, um, because comparing art from one image to another is not a skill that most people just carry around with them on an everyday basis. So I always start by making an obvious list. So the most obviously obvious thing that is similar about these two images, I would say are their arms. Both figures have short arms. Um, both figures are statues. But other than that, there's not as much as similar, other than they are both people, as there are differences. For one, the man in image A does not wear a head covering at all, whereas the woman in image B wears a head covering that's so large that you can't see her face. One has a very elongated neck, the other no neck at all. One is very robust and a Venus figure, the other is appears somewhat thin um, because of how flat the sculpture is. Image B belongs to a cold climate. Image A belongs to people that live in a warm climate. Image B is made of stone and image A is made of plaster and plant material. There's one more really important part here. And I want you to stop and see if you can figure it out. It is a similarity. So the similarity that I'm getting ready to tell you is a similarity that we associate with the two statues as being conceptual. If you can find a conceptual similarity, it's usually a pretty important similarity. Conceptually, both works of art deal with things that are unknown or unseen. Image B deals with the worship system. She's a Venus figure. We think that she is the primordial mother. We think that she um, was part of their worship belief system. Image A was also part of their ritual worship belief system because he was buried in a grave. So they both have to do with the afterlife. Now, what visually can you use to support the idea they both have to do with the afterlife? Well, you could say that image B has no face at all, and that image A really isn't a portrait of anybody. Like, if I went out on the street, I would not be able to recognize someone who looks like image A. So you could say they both have sort of nameless identities, uh, and that would support a belief in the afterlife system or a belief in the idea that both had something to do with the afterlife. Um, but other than that, knowing the cultural background information is important here in terms of the interpretation of the work of art. So I hope that I've shown you how learning all this background information is important when you go to talk about the meaning of the work of art. 
So another Neolithic society that we study uh, is Shatal Hoyuk. Shatal Hoyuk is in Anatola, um, and it's more in line time-wise with the site at Eingazal. Uh, you can see in this slide how the infrastructure of the city was built. Uh, there were no roads, and there was emphasis on building the houses or the units and dwellings close together. There were no roads because they were trying to create a city that was fortified um, naturally through its architecture. So instead of building a wall around the city the way they did at Jericho, they decided that if they built their houses all together um, and there was only one way into the house, it would be harder for people to get into their settlement. Uh, you can see that there's an emphasis on entering the dwelling through the rooftop. Uh, here's another schematic drawing of what the home looked like inside. Uh, you can see here to the left the ladder that allows the um, inhabitant to move from one level to the next level in the dwelling. There were rooftop pitches that allowed the in, uh, person to enter the dwelling from the roof, and the only light that they ever got was from that roof top area. Um, and so because the rooftop was closed in and uh, created or had like a sort of like a box lid on it, um, the only thing that they could do was sort of prop the ladder up to get in and out of the dwelling. I will show you a more detailed image of how they entered the um, dwelling once we look inside. We know that they had um, fire pits for pottery in the top part of the dwelling. Um, and we know they had areas to dry plants and preserve meat. The area where they would dry plants and then uh, move them into pottery that they had fired from the kilns above was a really important part of their long-term civilization growth. We talked about Jericho having the technology of clay pot building. Clay pot building was really important because if you could, even if you could harvest all the food you could possibly eat, if you didn't have a way to store it and store it without it going bad, it didn't do you any good to have extra crop. So making it through winters or through times where the crop wasn't as plentiful wasn't easy if you didn't have some sort of food storage system. Um, and so they had the technology to store food. They also had the technology to create the pots. Um, so those two things are really, really important. You can also see that um, they lived within the dwelling. They had sleeping area. Um, they had short walls and ridges to sort of divide areas of the dwelling into um, spaces that were purposeful. So, you know, a short wall would define where the bedroom was versus the kitchen and so on and so forth. This is a wall painting that um, we see sort of the specialized elements of society coming out. So we know that as the climate got warmer, going from the Paleolithic to the Neolithic societies, that the Neolithic societies were able to create more specialized skill sets like architecture, like infrastructure planning, 
um, like painting and sculpting. In this case, we see that they've developed enough or they've freed up enough time by not chasing the herd that they had more time to put into things like cave paintings. But we know that they still relied heavily on hunting and we know that partially because of this painting. You see that um, in the center of the wall painting, there is a herding animal and to its right, there's another herding animal. Well, actually that's my right, it's left. Um, there's a herding animal. On the ground, you see five or six men laying on the ground. This is a depiction of a hunt. It is also the first depiction that we've seen of multiple human beings and animals pictured together. The last image that we saw with a human being and animal pictured together only had one person pictured in the painting. Here we have many men pictured in the painting. And so we know that they were hunters and gatherers still. We do know, however, that they had domesticated crops. So we know that they had farming technology as well as hunting and gathering. We also get the very first landscape painting from Chatal Huyok. Up until now, paintings were created solely on the stone walls. But at Chatal Huyuk, we actually found a plastered painting. So this is a type of fresco painting, and you'll hear me talk about this more later in the course. But this is the type of fresco painting that we refer to as true fresco, or in the Italian terms, bone fresco. It's a technique in which the plaster and the paint mix together and the plaster and the paint become the painting. So the paint is actually part of the wall. So what would have happened here was that they put down a layer of wet plaster and then the artist combined plaster pigment, plaster and pigment together to create a painted color. You also get twisted perspective here because you're looking at the settlement from a bird's eye view, so above it, but then you're looking at the side profile of this brown mass. The brown mass is actually a volcano. We know that at some point there was a volcano that erupted um, near Chatal Huyuk, and we think that it's possible that this particular plaster painting was one to warn the people who lived in the dwelling about the mountain that may erupt. We don't really know for sure. Um, we don't really know for sure what happened to the inhabitants at Chatal Huyuk or what the interpretation of the painting really is, but it is definitely something that art historians suspect that the people that lived there were trying to communicate to future generations. Remember that these settlements were lasted for a long period of time, in this case about 2,000 years, um, different communities were inhabiting Chatal Huyuk. Um, as we saw in Jericho and as we saw at Ein Gazal, it the same group of people doesn't always stay constant within the area. Uh, people come and go uh, and use the area for a long period of time and then they'll abandon the area or another group will come in and take over and so um, the settlement isn't used and then all of a sudden somebody will come back and inhabit the settlement over again. So we get these interesting um, shifts in building. In other words, somebody comes in, they inhabit, they build, and then they abandon the site. Two or 300 years go by, and then another group of people come in and build onto what we see now today.
there's another type of technology that was really important um, in terms of building that came about in Neolithic societies, and it's called corbeling. Um, corbeling is a type of building technique that the architect or mason will lay the bricks of the dwelling slightly off center and stack them in a way that helps them to support their own weight so that the dwelling doesn't fall inward on itself. Now this will make a little bit more sense to you when I show you the next slide. Um, this corbelled chamber is a chamber that leads to a long hallway in which the people of New Grange buried their dead. Here you can see the corbelled chamber or the corbelled vault passageway that leads to the um, grave area. The stones are very large and so we refer to them as megaliths and um, the chamber or the vault leads to the main burial chamber that are under that's underneath the ground. This is an aerial view of the Neolithic settlement of Hagar Quim in Malta. Um, you can see a lot of the same concepts that we've been looking at in the other settlements here in Hagar Quim. Uh, they used the idea of the fortified wall around the city to protect it. St uh, walls were made of stone and built fairly high and thick and massive. And the infrastructure of the town was protected uh, by creating a town that was sort of self-sufficient and the architecture was all compacted within itself. Uh, this again is the ruins of Hagar Quim in Malta. It is one of the, it, it has, has one of the earliest stone temples in the world. It's about 5,000 years old and is just as remarkably sophisticated as the other Neolithic societies that we've looked at in this lecture. But I think the most popular of Neolithic societies that um, my students find to be fascinating is Stonehenge. Stonehenge, I'm just going to give you some factual information right now. I'm never going to ask you to recall how tall the tallest stone of Stonehenge is or how wide the circle of Stonehenge is. So just put your pencil down and listen here for a moment. Stonehenge is named a henge because a henge is basically a large uh, piling of stones. Um, it is the stones are arranged in a circle that is 97 feet in diameter from the inside and 99 or 100 feet in diameter from the outside. There is a keystone or a heel stone that marks the position of the sun on the summer solstice. And the tallest stone within the henge is 24 feet tall. A henge is simply an arrangement of megalithic stones. A megalithic stone is a fancy name for a big stone. The outside stones were very massive and they were more plentiful when the site was built. We refer to those outside stones as sarsen stones. They're simply a type of hard sandstone. The visitor center at Stonehenge estimates that it took 200 people 12 days to move the very large sarsen stones that weighed up to 40 tons to this area. 
The closest source for the stones were 20 plus miles away from this site in North Wilshire. There were smaller stones called blue stones, but they were more unique. They came from West Wales, which was about 150 miles away. There were originally 80 of them, and they weighed up to five tons. Stonehenge is a megalithic structure that uses a building technique called post and lintel. So what is post and lintel construction? It is uh, what you see here in this slide. It is basically a construction that we use today in modern building. Um, my house is built in post and lentil construction. Basically, you have two vertical posts that run up and down. One touches the ground and one goes up into the sky. And then you have a lintel, a beam that runs across the two posts and connects them together. Now, Stonehenge was a special type of post and lintel construction. I call it ancient Lego construction. You see, each stone was individually carved to fit into the lintel that was customized for the posts. So the post would have a notch on the top of it that was maybe round in shape and only the lintel with a round shaped hole on the underneath side would be able to go on top of that post. That becomes fairly tricky when you try to put to restore a site like Stonehenge because a lot of the stones have been knocked over or fallen because of how old the site is. So you can see here from this aerial view how many of the stones have actually overturned um, and how that would be challenging to put together, um, recreate the henge based on the fact that some of the stones are just simply missing, um, the fact that the lintels only go with certain posts, etc. For a long time, we believed that Stonehenge was a calendar uh, because it has a special stone called a keystone. That keystone aligns perfectly with the sun uh, on a bright day in, uh, in May, I believe, or maybe June. Um, anyway, it, it aligns perfectly with the sun on the day of the start of the summer solstice. Um, but now we have further evidence that Stonehenge may have been part of ritualistic life for the Neolithic people. If you look at the Delve Deeper assignment for this week and you choose the activity on Stonehenge, you will be watching a small video from one of the leading researchers in Stone on Stonehenge. His name is Parker Pearson. Uh, for a while, Parker Pearson worked with the British Museum. Now I believe he's a professor, um, but he's a guest speaker a lot at many different events um, when they're talking about Paleolithic and Neolithic societies. And he believes that sites like Stonehenge were built in stages, which seems to make sense because we know that there were other Neolithic sites that were built in stages. The original inhabitants came and built a site and then moved out of the site and then another group of people came and added on to what was there. And so it makes logical sense that Stonehenge would be a site like that, that um, different groups of people came in at different times and added to the Henge. Um, but there was a lot of energy expelled to create this particular um, site, right? Like they had to move stones over 150 miles away here 
to the site. Um, we have found skulls and bones buried within the site, but we know that they came from much later civilizations of people called the Druids. There were many sites other than just Stonehenge found in England. Um, they were preserved by the England English Historical Society, and they are sites that have been excavated by Parker Pearson. Um, those sites were ones that gave researchers a lot more information about what Stonehenge's purpose was uh, over a period of time. Um, those sites were excavated more readily and so because of those sites being excavated so extensively uh, we know more about Stonehenge. Stonehenge has not itself been excavated the way that the site that's about 20 miles away from it was. Um, that's partly because they wanted to preserve one of the sites completely intact without um, sort of tut without uh, being disturbed by researchers um, so that they could preserve the heritage of it just the way it was. Um, I've been to Stonehenge twice now. Um, we always go in the winter time during Christmas break and um, the Salisbury Plain at that time is really windy and really wet so I don't recommend that you go to um, visit it during the uh, winter season. It's much more pleasant during the summer season. Um, and it's outside of a town in the countryside of England in Wiltshire. Um, and it's really, to some degree, sort of underwhelming. It, there's a lot of hype around Stonehenge because it's such a large, such a well-preserved um, monument. Um, and because of that, it's sort of um, more present than some of the other Neolithic societies, which all we have left are ruins. Um, but the mysteries around Stonehenge have been things that scientists have been trying to solve for uh, 50 or plus years now. Um, and so I think that it being so readily available, so much more um, is there than for the, from the other sites. Um, and so I think it's made it more tantalizing for people to research. I highly recommend that you look up Parker Pearson um, and that you watch some of his videos if you're interested in Stonehenge. Stonehenge is a fascinating place to visit. Um, you can even go to their website and look at their visitor center and just listen to the recording that they um, use for visitors.